had published, the Carnegie Foundation had published, Campus Life in Search of Community. And there's a very interesting passage uh, from Ernie's speech that I want to share with you. He writes, starting that monograph, meaning Campus Life in Search of Community, we tried to take each of the campus social pathologies and make recommendations to overcome each. Well, there's this problem, well, there's that problem, yeah, we got that problem over there. But many of, these, many of these ideas, these solutions, had already been tried and found inadequate. Out of desperation, I discarded the tired, bulleted recommendations about how to fix the campus community crisis and began to reflect on the central questions. Putting on my green cape, I asked, what are the principles on which a higher learning community is founded? What is the infrastructure of meaning and purpose in a campus community? So you can see that shift that he and his colleagues underwent in, uh, in, in, in writing that uh, report. And if you take a look at what they came up with, that uh, campus life really needs to emphasize uh, a, a purposeful community, an open community, a just, disciplined, caring, celebrative community, it almost reads like a list of positive psychology strengths and virtues. So very, very consonant there. Okay. Um, we, so, uh, we can ask the question, is it possible then to cultivate more happiness? Uh, so, is it just something you're born with? Is it something that, that can be changed? We talked about three different interventions, the three blessings exercise, the gratitude visit, and identifying your signature strengths and using them in a new way. I picked these three for a very specific reason, and that is that a study was done comparing the results of these three. And I'll just give you one slide from that study. Uh, the control condition was memory. So um, folks were recruited online. There was a little button that you, you know, if you want to help out with research, click here. And then people were randomly assigned to a control group or different experimental groups. The control group was every night for one week, write about your childhood memories. So people wrote about childhood memories and it didn't make them significantly happier. Uh, folks did the three blessings exercise. And um, after one week, they weren't significantly happier. But look what happens after a month. And after six months, they were significantly happier. After one week of writing about what happened good in your life and why, the researchers were puzzled too. So they went back and asked, you know, what's going on here? And what they found is that these people never stopped doing the homework, that they liked it so much that they continued doing it, and the people who continued doing it got the most benefit from it. Gratitude visit. Notice what happens here. There's a boost immediately as soon as you do it. It's a powerful experience. And look what happens. It makes people happier. One week out, one month out, they're still happier than the control group. Six months later, it's time to do another gratitude visit. Strengths. Uh, using your strengths in a new way. One week out, one month out, six months out, there are still these uh, positive effects. And there have been some uh, studies that have been done also in uh, settings with people who, who are depressed, who have psychopathologies, um, and specifically around depression, those results have been uh, very, very promising. For more information, the Positive Psychology Center's website, positivepsychology.org. Um, AuthenticHappiness.org is where you can find a lot of the free assessment tools, including the uh, the uh, values in action classification to identify your, st your signature strengths. If you're interested in checking out my, my blog, that's where that is. I want to turn now to one final um, uh, point, uh, one final area very quickly that I think is, is very important. Remember we wanted to talk about suggestions for higher ed and, and, and positive psychology. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in talking about possible ways in which positive psychology can help with student affairs. You guys are the experts on this. I'm not. You've got a, a number of wonderful presenters who, who are going to be talking about positive psychology, strengths-based uh, approaches to orientation, housing and residence life, retention, and career development. I just wish that you guys had been there when I was in college because it would have been really great to have had some of, these, some of those strengths, some of that knowledge in my pocket as I walked through the, uh, the, the education experience. But what I would like to do is just take a couple of minutes to talk about positive psychology and the transformation of the curriculum. Because I think it's very important to have positive psychology and strengths-based uh, approaches available in the student services realm, in realms that are outside of the classroom even, uh, and so on. Um, and I think it's also powerful to bring it into the classroom. Think about the case of service versus service learning. Service is incredibly important. And what happens when service gets brought into the classroom? 
then the curriculum gets transformed. And it's a whole new level of learning, right? It's a whole new level of interaction with the, with the material, with the subject matter. So similarly, one of the suggestions that, that Ernie Boyer actually made about history is why don't we have a history class where instead of you know, studying all the wars that happened, one right after each other, okay, what was the next war after that? And then what was the next war? And what was the next war? He had, he had just read an article in the Christian Science Monitor where there was some World Heritage Foundation, I think it was by the UN, something like that, had just gone through and identified 165 national or international world historical sites. Sites like um, Cusco in Peru, sites like um, uh, the Old Wall in Jerusalem, uh, sites that are of, of, of major cultural significance to everyone. And he thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have a class around that? And so you study the culture, you study the, the site, you study the architecture, you study what it meant, what, and that's, where, that's how you learn your, your, your civilization. That would be a very interesting way uh, to, to proceed. Um, philosophy and logic. Uh, I, I, again, I wish I had about three or four hours to talk about this, but you don't, so I'll be very brief. Um, one, uh, here's what I want to say about this. So in the ancient world, the psychologists were really the philosophers, right? And so there was an overarching metaphor that the philosophers had. Uh, and Martha Nussbaum um, uh, has a book out about this. Uh, and, and, and she talks about this overarching metaphor of the physician. So the philosopher is the doctor of the soul. So you're sick, you come to the philosopher, the philosopher will heal you. It will hurt, but you will get better, right? So that's sort of this overarching um, metaphor. Nussbaum has this book called The Therapy of Desire where she traces that out in fabulous, wonderful, interesting detail. There's just one thing she left out. There's also another overarching metaphor that these Greek philosophers had. Not just thinking of themselves as doctors of the soul, they also thought of themselves as trainers for the Olympic, as coaches preparing people to perform at the highest levels of competition. How does that metaphor shift change the way you think about what you do, the way you think about your role in thinking philo philosophically and so forth, right? It's a red cape versus a green cape approach. But again, it's, it's overlooked. So what would happen if we switched lenses there? Um, I'll just mention one other thing. Um, well, okay, very briefly, theater, character development. Who are the people on campus who are the experts at developing character? It's people in creative writing and especially the theater people, right? And they know how to create characters on stage. I bet you they could help us in creating characters, all the world's a stage, Shakespeare said. So what if there were some methods, and I'm thinking here specifically of Stanislavski methods and other, how, how could we harness the use of the incredible talent that is on in the theater programs to move beyond merely the stage into our lives? And we can talk about that more afterwards if you're interested. I just want to f finish up on mathematics. I was a math major in college. Anybody else a math major here? All right, good, good deal, right. Um, now, I don't know about you, but when I was doing math, I really had no idea what I was doing. I did it. I did it well. I enjoyed it. There's nothing like doing a whole page of calculus and getting to the end. It's two. I bet you it's two. I bet you it's two. You look it up in the back of the book. It's two! Yes! It's such a rush. Right? It's a rush, right? He knows, yeah. Um, and so... Um, uh, but I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, why am I doing this? Did, did you ever, were you ever seated in a math class when somebody asked that question? Or did you ever ask that question? Why are we doing this? What answer did you get? Because there's an exam tomorrow. You need to study, right? You'll need this later on, yeah. right? Don't cause problems. Just focus on what you, I think even the teachers oftentimes don't know why we're doing it. Right? And one of the things that Ernie Boyer emphasized was the importance of purpose. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? Right? And so I think that in mathematics, one of the major problems with the way mathematics education is done today is we have a crisis of meaning. We don't know why we're doing it. We don't know what we're doing. It's because mathematics has been, these, these methods have been wrenched out of the historical and philosophical settings and they've been pl put in front of us as plug and chug techniques. Right? So here's what happens. When two